Hi, it's time for another verb of the day. Today's verb is swirl. And our verb today really only has one definition, and that is to move or to cause something to move in a twisting or a spiraling pattern. So sometimes as I've read literature and someone is trying to describe kind of the weather conditions, right, they might talk about the wind or dust swirling, right, moving in that twisting or spiraling pattern. You might see it used in connection to art. And we'll continue to look at some more examples of it in, in uh, just a few minutes in this video. You should know that swirl is a regular verb. To make the progressive form of this verb, all you need to do is add ing to form swirling. The past tense and participle forms of this verb can be made by adding ed. Our base verb, swirl, ul, ul, ends in a voiced L sound. This means that our past tense ending is just going to make a D sound. So we're not adding an extra syllable as we say it. It should sound like this, swirled, swirled. Now, there are a couple phrasal verbs that you might encounter. Um, they are to swirl about or swirl around. Each of these have uh, two definitions or two ways to use them, um, and they're, they're both connected. So the first way you might hear swirl about or swirl around used is to mean to move around and encircle something in a twisting motion. Let's look at some example sentences of this. The dog was swept up and swirled around by a tiny tornado. As I looked for examples of this verb being used, that was uh, a recent headline um, in, in one publication, right? So we can imagine like this, this storm sort of encircling, right? Forming a circle around the dog, right? And it kind of being lifted up and, um, into the air. A second example. Dust swirled about the barn, okay? Here's that example I was talking about in literature, right? Trying to create this kind of mental picture for us, right? In that dust moving in a, in a circular kind of or twisting motion. The second way you'll hear swirl about and swirled around used is more about information or ideas being shared or being passed uh, among a particular group of people. This usually happens in response to something. So let's again look at some examples of this. Rumors have been swirling around since his arrest. Okay, so here's the, the first action, right? Someone, some man in this case, is arrested, right? And now people are beginning to talk. <gasps> is it because of this? Is it because of that, right? Right? So it's that idea. Um, again, we can't really see information, um, but kind of like moving and passing through um, as, as uh, dirt or dust in, in my earlier example. Another example of this might be questions have swirled about who is liable for the tragedy. Okay, so here must have been some sort of horrible accident, some sort of horrible event, and people are discussing who is responsible right, for this, this terrible thing. Now let's continue using our verb of the day in a couple different verb tenses. Today we're going to practice the past progressive and the imperative. Let's start with the past progressive. We use this verb tense to talk about ac an action that was ongoing in the past. Many times we're going to see the past progressive describing that ongoing, it, uh, ongoing action and having, having it interrupted by another action. Right? So we might see past progressive used in connection or, or conjunction with the simple past tense. That interrupting action is always in the simple past tense. But you might see past progressive used all by itself, right? Just noting that some action was continuing during a certain period. Now, some teachers and textbooks will call this the past continuous, and that's great. That's fine. It means the exact same thing. Again, and you, if you're a regular watcher of my videos, you know uh, that I have little tips and tricks for my students. So here, past progressive, 
two Ps, I want my students to remember I need two parts to make my verb. So in the affirmative, I'm going to have my subject, right? Then I'm, and I'm going to pay attention to that subject. If my subject is I, he, she, or it, I'm, my next part of my verb is going to be was, and then the ing form of the verb. But if my subject is you, we, or they, I'm going to use were, and then the ing form of the verb. So part one, past form of be, was or were, and then the second part of my verb is that ing form. So let's take a look at an example. A witness to the skydiving, skydiving accident said he was swirling down. It almost looked like he wasn't awake. Okay, so uh, the person who unfortunately witnessed something quite horrible, um, this was a, a quotation describing what he saw, and it again kind of paints that picture of someone making this circular, spiraling, or twisting motion. Uh, and unfortunately, as this person was falling to the ground. Now, if I want to make a negative past progressive sentence, I start with my subject. And again, I pay attention because then I'm going to use either was or were, then not, and then the ing form the verb. You might hear some speakers use wasn't and then the ing form or weren't and the ing form. That's great. They all mean the same thing. So let's take a look at another example. The smoke wasn't swirling when the fire department arrived. So maybe um, we're describing a situation where someone called uh, for help prior to uh, a fire uh, and really spreading and, and, and becoming much larger and kind of having this idea of, of smoke swirling around a structure. We can make yes or no questions in the past progressive to do this. I start with was or were, then I'm going to have my subject, then the ing form of the verb. Here's a yes or no uh, question example. Were fears swirling about the bank's health in February? Okay. So again, that's that idea. Um, many times we're talking about ideas, information here, maybe feelings of like, oh, is this in trouble? Is this okay? Are people talking and sharing that kind of, of worry? Now let's talk about the imperative. This is a rather unique uh, way we, we create sentences in, uh, in English. We use it to give commands. So we're trying to tell someone to do something. And what's special about this is we do not have a stated subject. When we use the imperative, we can begin a sentence just with our, our verb uh, and the base verb at that. Okay? The reason for that is the subject is implied. It's you, either singular or plural, depending on how many people you're talking to. So we can just start our sentence with the verb and then share that information. What action do we want them to do? Now, sometimes I've had students tell me, oh my goodness, Katie, that seems rude just to tell someone to do what to do, right? So if you want to soften things, make it a little more polite, you could always begin the sentence with the word please and then your verb. Or you can start with the verb and end the sentence with please. That's fine. Um, if, if that feels a little kinder, um, then I encourage you to, to communicate in a way that that feels right to you. So let's take a look at an example of an affirmative imperative sentence. It is, swirl the cream cheese filling into the brownie batter. Okay, so here, this is a command, right? It's telling us what to do. This is a, a type of sentence you might see in uh, some directions uh, or a recipe to cook something, right? Providing the different st steps, right? So they're, again, kind of thinking about sort of making this twisting, spiraling motion with this particular ingredient into our others. Now, if you want to make a negative imperative sentence, then you can begin with do not and then the base verb. And again, if that seems maybe a little too direct, you could always start with please or add please to the end of your sentence, but you don't need it in both places. Let's take a look at an example sentence. Don't swirl sparkling wine. Now this sentence might not make a lot of sense, so I've brought in a picture here to kind of help illustrate this. So maybe 
Uh, if you're a person who, who happens to drink, maybe you've seen people do this, kind of take their glass and make the wine or liquid go around in kind of a, a circular uh, motion. Um, and I hope you can maybe kind of see that through the, the different pictures on the bottom of the screen. I am not much of a drinker, so I, I um, wasn't really aware of this, but apparently you're not supposed to do that. So <laughs> that would be uh, kind of a command, I would imagine, from someone who knows a great deal uh, about how to properly drink uh, different types of wine. Now, let's spend a moment just looking at some words that are related to our verb swirl. And the first word we're going to talk about um, is just the noun form of this word. So the exact same spelling and the exact same pronunciation. The noun swirl is generally referring to a quantity, uh, uh, to an almost like another noun of, of something, some kind of movement that is in um, a spiraling type of pattern. So an example of this might be, her painting had swirls of teal, white, and gray. And I've got a, a picture here to kind of help us maybe uh, imagine what that might look like, right? So we've got these different sort of colors um, move, made in um, uh, flowing sort of spirally patterns. Another related word you might encounter is the adjective swirly. So this is moving in a swirling pattern or having swirls. An example, these swirly sculptures have been very popular with park visitors. So again, something you might encounter in art, um, kind of the, the idea of, of having different textures, different colors, moving in sort of a spiraling or twisting sort of pattern or motion. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you have a great day.